We have two gentlemen from Result Tech. And if you remember nothing else as you are listening to them, I would encourage you to remember three key terms. Accelerate, enable, and transform. Because they will be talking about, they, they will be sharing with you information uh, about accelerating and enabling you and your teams and the state government and how we do things that will put you in a position where more effectively you can start to transform how we do state government. Result Tech assists organizations with improving their software delivery process. They're here today to talk about creating successes by leveraging project realities. And that is key to what this entire summit is about. <clears throat> so with no further delay, I would like to welcome Bob Hedgecock and Scott Reed from Result Tech. Andrea, thank you very much for that great introduction. It's been a great event. Um, I hope all of you had a fantastic morning today. It sounds like you've had a lot of learnings and, and taken a lot of things back uh, from, th uh, from the sessions. I'd like to start out with a couple of thank yous. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Carlos Ramos for his vision in pulling this program together, as well as his commitment for providing tools and capabilities and processes to this team. I'd also like to thank Russell Hicks and the uh, Public Sector Partners team for pulling the program together and the coordination. But most importantly, I'd like to thank all of you for your involvement in this, for, for your participation and engagement, and most importantly, for taking these ideas and concepts back to your particular teams and driving future success in what you're doing. Uh, we had a lot of flexibility as the topics that we worked on, um, and Scott and I talked about potentially uh, choosing some of the kind of the textbook project management methodologies. And we came to a conclusion, you've probably all read the, that material before, you're really familiar with it. We really wanted to focus on some of the realities that we're seeing that make those textbook methodologies a little bit more challenging. There's actually two themes that we wanted to, to key in on and to provide you a little bit of feedback on that we think you can actually take and, and actually leverage to help you drive future successes in your projects. So today we're gonna focus on we're going to take this in three different steps. First of all, focus on these key themes and background issues that are happening. Secondly, talk through some of the techniques that you can use. And then thirdly, we'll have a little bit of time for question and answer at the end of the session. Uh, if you have additional questions, we'll be available off to the side at the end, uh, at the end of the day today. Please feel free to come by, talk to us about, about your particular situation, what you're trying to do with your teams, and, and any kinds of techniques that we could do to potentially help you out with that. Scott and I have over 20 years of experience in leading teams, both from, from leading development teams as well as from doing coaching. And we're really excited and passionate about sharing the experiences that we've had with other organizations and helping people to achieve a level of, of performance and capability that, they've, that they have never experienced or never thought was possible before. And I'm sure that all of you will find material that's, avail that's useful for you in this, regardless of whether you're starting a project using the New Star program or if you have um, started a project and are midway through a project that you started prior to that rollout. So where do we start? We'd like to start with the overall um, project management triangle. I'm sure that all of you have seen this triangle before. It's a pretty basic standard triangle. It really says, fundamentally, if I, if I can manage a project to be on time, um, inside a scope, and on budget, I'll have a successful project. Seems like a pretty basic concept, right? Seems pretty easy. How many of you have an easy time doing it, though? Projects today are really complex. There's so many people involved in them. Um, there's so many unknowns going on with projects that that makes even managing the basic blocking and tackling things of a project really difficult to do. But what we're finding is that there's actually two other situations that are happening, two other backdrops behind this that are making it both more challenging as well as if you are capable of delivering a project on time, on budget, and inside a scope, you still might have a failed project. And that's a pretty scary thought, right? I see a number of people nodding their heads. I mean, just think about all the effort that you put into managing a project, you hit what you think is a home run, and then people say, wow, that was a dud. That didn't have the, the value and the impact that we wanted to have. So what we want to talk about are what those trends are and what those things, what's causing that to happen, and then how you can actually take those, those issues and actually use them and leverage them to drive more success for your particular teams. So the first thing I wanted to start out with is, is a topic related to acceleration of, of rate of change. So if I go back and think about when I was in middle school, I, 
One of my first memories, not a particularly fond memory, but one of my first memories was pulling together research papers. And you go to the card catalog in the library, pull out material, write down different subjects, go through and do some more research, then you might come to the conclusion there isn't the material that you're looking for, so then you go to the public library and do some more research. That might take three or four days to pull together your list of subjects for your, uh, for your research paper. A couple years later, our family got an Encyclopedia Britannica set. That was really neat, right? You could sit down in the comfort of your home, read the material, look at the pictures, you had access to information, what seemed like a lot of information, very, very quickly. See some people nodding their heads? <laughs> yep. So today, Google has completely changed and transformed how we think about access to information. Right? You have access to any amount of information, just about anything is available at your fingertips from any location almost instantaneously. Uh, I have a, two children, I have a six-year-old and a nine-year-old, both are boys, and they, they're really excited about using the voice, um, the voice search on my phone. And from any place, they can, they can ask questions and they can get answers to anything that they have an interest in. They can ask questions at a baseball game, they can ask questions at a grocery store. They can ask questions while we're in the back of the car driving to school, and they have access to almost anything that they want almost instantaneously. A second example is, is smartphones. Um, smartphones are actually a very complex device. If you think about hardware being embedded in it, you think about an operating system, you think about applications sitting on top of it, uh, wireless connectivity, cell phone capabilities, you even have to go through a certification process with the cell phone providers. So there's a lot of complexity in that device. Yet if you take a look at the release cycles for these devices, they're coming out faster and faster. The Samsung Galaxy S was first introduced into the marketplace in June of 2010. Just four short years later, we're now at the Gal Galaxy S, uh, S5. So five different releases over the course of four years. I mean, fundamentally, once you buy a cell phone, it's pretty much outdated by the time that you take it home with you. The third example, Facebook is a good example of, of this. When I started my career, the, the really good productive software companies were doing new releases for major functionality about once every year and a half or once every two years. And they might do another minor release inside of that time frame, but fundamentally their major release cycle was once every 18 to 24 months. That cycle time worked out really well for the, for the providers. They had to go through a process of doing requirements, doing design, writing the software, doing testing, then they go to alpha testing with their customers, and they go to beta testing, and it took a long time for them to go from end to end. It was also important from a customer's perspective that they not take releases any faster than that either, because they had a lot of work to do in taking in, changing the infrastructure, um, doing testing, and all that kind of work, so they didn't want releases that much faster either. But organizations like Facebook now are realizing that the faster they go through those cycles, even if they shorten or decrease the amount of information that they can get into those or the amount of change in there, the faster they can go through those cycles, the faster they can take advantage of new learnings in the marketplace, the faster they can take advantage of competitive opportunities. And so they're using techniques like um, continuous delivery methodologies where they do automated build, deploy, um, testing and release processes. They're using SaaS-based infrastructure. They're using new and different um, development technologies and, and tools. And so organizations like Facebook now, instead of doing releases on an annual basis, are actually down into doing potentially multiple releases per day. So that gives them so many more opportunities to learn and so many more opportunities to roll that into their solutions. So what does all of this mean to us? I think there's really two fundamental things. One is that our customers and stakeholders have an increased expectation for faster changes, right? There's other solutions that are available in the marketplace, and increasingly, our customers and stakeholders are being asked, well, gee, if Google can come out with something in a couple of months, why can't we do it? Why does it take us two years or three years? So it's changing their expectation. I'm sure that you're hearing the same thing probably from some of the teams that you work with. The other thing is that our customers and stakeholders have an increased need for being able to make changes in their priorities much faster too, right? So what used to be multi-year planning cycles for them, they're getting increased pressure to change and be able to adapt faster. So that's driving changes for our teams and things that we need to be capable of adapting to. I'm sh the second trend that I'd like to talk about is the shift between a requirements focus to a focus on delivering value. 
I'm sure that everyone here has seen this picture before, right? So you fundamentally, the, the purpose of this picture, or what they we're talking about in this picture is the translation of requirements from the initial person that had the requirement or the per initial person that had the need to the end person who's implemented it, because it's gone through many cycles, it's been translated and changed and manipulated and quite, quite often what we've actually built really isn't what the original person wanted in the first place. So that clear is, clearly is an issue. But I think actually the more important issue is the final one. And that is that even if we were able to perfectly build what the customer wanted, a lot of times we're still going to miss the mark. And there's three reasons for that. One is that the customer quite often doesn't even know what they want, right? So without the ability to see, feel, and touch what it is that they're doing, they don't really know. They've helped you put together a requirements document, but until they actually see it, they don't really know if that's what they want. Secondly, I talked a little bit earlier about the increasing rate of change, right? So the longer the time frame between when they had those requirements to the time that you actually implement it, their world has changed, their environment has changed. And so their needs are going to change as they go through that. The third thing is that our stakeholders are basically signing up to meeting a certain set of outcomes. They're translating those into requirements for our teams with their best guess that if they accomplish those requirements, they're going to be able to, to meet those outcomes. But they've really signed up to meeting some outcomes. So what we need to do is help to bridge the gap between original requirements and helping them to meet their outcomes and help them to meet their needs. Once again, I think this is causing a pretty fundamental shift between delivering on the capabilities and the scope that was originally requested to delivering on the, on the actual needs or the actual outcome or value that is expected and being signed up for for the program. So at this point, I'd like to transition over and talk about um, an example that I have some personal experience with that's a very simple concept that ties together these couple of different concepts. It's a non-technology example, and it's, I think, something that you've all have been familiar with. Um, and we'll talk about some of these key themes as we go for forward into the presentation. But a couple years ago, I had the opportunity to work with an organization that is the leading provider of emergency management solutions. Their solutions cover over 75% of the population of the country. And their patient tracking solution was used um, to help manage the Boston Marathon bombing incident. So we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. And some of the concepts that you're going to hear in this that I think you can tie back, both the increasing rate of change and being able to make decisions very quickly and being able to be flexible on those decisions, and then secondly, being value focused. So if you remember, in April 15th of 2013, two bombs exploded, caused over 260 injuries, caused over 13 people to, um, to have a limb amputated, and uh, caused three deaths. Patients were, t were cared for um, and addressed in 27 different uh, local hospital facilities. Clearly, there were too many people, too many patients involved in this incident for the, for the medical system to take advantage and to take care of all of those patients all at the same time. So they really had to focus on providing the, b the best care or providing the care for the most amount of people and, and providing the most amount of value for those constituents. So they used a model, it's a relatively simple triaging process, it's used across the country in order to help the providers focus their efforts on the patients that had the most, the most need and, and try to do the best good for the overall system. It starts out with a triage tag. It's a relatively simple tag. Um, it goes around your neck, it's a string that goes around your neck, it has a little card on it, and it has four colors on it. These colors are really a great dynamic prioritization list, right? It makes it really easy and visible to understand um, which patients should be cared for first. Patients that are green have medical injuries, they, ha they, need, to, they need medical care and they need medical attention, but they can, they can be delayed. They don't have to be transported immediately for medical care. Patients that are categorized as red need medical care fairly quickly, otherwise they're likely to die on site. Patients that are categorized as black, may be, they may still be alive but are not expected to live, and so actually the appropriate treatment for them is to leave them on site and to not transport them to a hospital facility, because in so doing, they may use up valuable resources that could impact and could be used to save other people's lives. Those patients then are put in treatment and transport areas. So they put down a tarp, 
um, red, yellow, green, and black makes it an easy visualization of, of which patients are where. It also makes it very easy for, um, for the EMS agencies or the paramedics to go through and re-triage and reassess those patients. So some patient that's green, if they have uh, additional medical issues and their, their status deteriorates, they easily move them into the yellow category. If somebody's yellow and they have an injury, they can easily move them into the red category. So they constantly go through, take the most recent information, and move them through the prioritization, focusing on the things that are the highest value to the overall system. Then they queue up the ambulances. So when they have ambulances available, and when they have um, medical facilities that have the appropriate capabilities to take care of those patients, they then dispatch the patients and move them into those facilities. Paramedics always picking up the patients from the red category first, then move into yellow, then move into green. So this is a really simple, simple model, um, and I think it's, it kind of draws some parallels to some topics that we can talk about in the rest of the, rest of the session. And we'll talk about how to take the concepts of um, a dynamically prioritized list, focusing on value, and making changes in a very fast iterative process through the rest of the presentation. So in the first section, we've talked about a couple of different themes, right? We talked about increasing rate of change. We talked about how important that is to our constituents. We've talked about the change in our shareholders and how they're viewing it as being a change from focusing on requirements to focusing on value. And at this point, I'd like to switch over and talk about how do we actually take, how do we actually take that cycle time, right? That the thing is causing a lot of our team's issue and all of those changes that are happening. How do we take it, something that's a challenge for most of our projects, and actually leverage it as being an advantage for us? How do we actually use that to drive increased value and success for our projects? So this theme is gonna be faced both, you know, based on increasing cycle time and providing delivery faster and better visibility. So at this point, I'd like to start out with an exercise. And there should be a pad of paper and pens on all of your tables. I'm not sure that there's enough pads of paper and pens for everybody. But if you could just rip off a sheet, you'll just need one, one piece of paper. And I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. And I'm gonna ask you to, I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes and I'll give you three simple instructions and then I'll ask you to open your eyes afterwards, okay? So when everyone has a piece of paper, piece of paper and a pen. Okay, perfect. So close your eyes. And first of all, so step number one, I'd like you to draw a triangle with your eyes closed that's three inches by three inches by three inches. Secondly, I'd like you to draw a rectangle outside of the triangle that's four inches tall and three inches wide. And the third instruction, this is the last, right? So you don't have to worry about it anymore. Third one is to draw a circle inside of that triangle. So the largest circle that you can inside the triangle. You can't laugh. This isn't that hard, right? It's just three steps. <laughs> okay, now you can open your eyes. So maybe we should take a look at your picture. So I, so I can tell So I can tell by the reaction. <laughs> so I can tell by the reaction that you probably, that you may not have drawn exactly what you thought you would have, right? Did anyone draw a picture that looked like this? One. So we have one person that, that lies, right? <laughs> oh, very good, nicely done. Good. 
and I'm sure that you've gone through and you've taken a look at what other people drew, right? Does your drawing look anything like the rest of the people on your table? No. Nope. So here's the key takeaway, right? Even with really simple and very clear instructions and requirements, it's really challenging without visibility, it's really challenging to innovate and to, and to have predictable outcomes, right? I mean, those are very simple instructions. You can imagine all of the things that we're doing are so much more sophisticated than what we just walked through. So in reality, as humans, we all need to see, feel, and touch that which we do, right? When we're coming up with new and different creative things, we have to see, feel, and touch it. Regardless of whether it's doing pottery, baking a cake, painting a picture, writing software, any time that there's new and different and creative things that we're doing, we have to see, feel, and touch. We just can't do it in the absence of that. So if that's the case, why do most of our projects look like this? Right? Why is the visibility that we provide back to our constituents a simple status report of here's the amount that's done, right? Here's the percentage complete. What is our constituents, I mean, what's the feedback that they get from that? Basically, the only thing that they can interpret out of that is um, it's not done, right? They probably don't believe that 58% is actually the right number, and they have no idea how long it's going to take from actually being done to when they can actually use it and derive value from it, right? We have also lost, in that time frame, we've also lost all of the opportunity to get feedback and incorporate feedback into, into the end solution. So what can we do about that? So let's start out with kind of our typical project flow. First of all, we typically start out with putting together requirements, right? Then we go out and we put together an RFP, we get the project justified, we move on uh, to signing a contract with the, with the vendor, um, then we move into execution phase, so we build one component, then we build another component, then we do some database design work, and then we move into check and we start pulling together and integrating all of these different components into a particular solution. And then we deliver it to our customers, right? So the delivery happens at the end, and in that time frame, there's not very much feedback that happens and there's not very much ability for us to incorporate feedback from our constituents. So the issue with that is that risk increases with time, right? The further out the project goes, the more risk we have. A one-month project, there's not very much risk. A three-month project, there's more. A year-long project, now we're starting to build up quite a bit of risk, right? So what do we need to do from a project management perspective? We have to take our, um, our uh, you know, project management skills and tools and try to mitigate the risks that we can but you have to be an expert marksman to hit the target, right? You have to know the further out it goes, you have to know how far am I gonna pull the string back? How much correction do I have to deal with for wind correction and those kinds of things? But it gets just a little bit worse because the target is constantly moving. I talked about those changes and the increasing rate of change, right? So the longer the time frame we go from the original idea to when we actually implement it, the more of those changes that are happening. And there's no way that we can control those. We have no idea what those changes are going to be, and we don't, we don't control or manage those things. So we're really caught in a catch-22. We have to plan as much as we can for the things that we can control. But then we have these other set of factors that we have no control over. So what do we do with those? So it's actually relatively simple. It's relatively straightforward. We just build closer targets, right? So we just do shorter time frames. By doing so, we decrease the amount of risk. The other thing that's really interesting about this is I don't have to hit a bullseye every time I shoot the arrow because I'm going to have an, an uh, as long as I hit the target, I have an opportunity to change and to correct and shoot after the next one and then the next one and the next one. So I don't have to hit a bullseye every time. I don't have to be quite as accurate every time. and we're providing value back to our constituents at each one of those single deliveries. So we're providing value much earlier on in the process. And so as we go through the process, the only risk that I have is the risk between here and my next target, right? It's not between here and the end goal, it's just between here and the next target. 
So how do we actually apply this? How do we actually use this in our projects? And I'd offer that you can definitely use these inside of the STAR program in the, as you go through that new rollout. I think there are a lot of these techniques so that you can use for a project that is currently in flight or that you're currently working on. So this is an example of the project that we had talked about before where we had the original requirements planning phase and then the target and the, and the delivery of value happens at the end of the process. The issue with this is that the target is just way too far out in the future. So what we, what we need to do now is we need to build and we need to readjust those milestones and instead of having those milestones be functional silos of things, we're going to readjust those so that those are defined by working software. And each of those components of working software has its own plan associated with it. So we have our whole plan, but the plan is really intended to get us to the first milestone. Then we do our next milestone, once again defined based off of working software, with its own plan associated with it. And that plan incorporates the feedback from, from the output of our first session and the first delivery. We do the same thing for the next milestone and the next until we actually hit our target and we end up meeting our, our final goal. So basically all we're doing here is we're just redefining our milestones and we're really just taking Deming's concepts and turning them on their side. But it's fundamentally very many of the same practices that you're using today. So now we'd like to, we had the opportunity recently to interview uh, Mark Noman. Mark has had a lot of experience in managing state projects. He's also managed projects for the military uh, with three different branches. So we interviewed him. We have a little audio clip and then a little video clip for him. Well, for the military, I've done a lot of work uh, on Air Force programs and Navy programs primarily. Uh, recently, I've been helping a program for the United States Army developing uh, tactical data link processing software. So this is software that uh, sits between uh, radios that allow warfighters to communicate with each other and also with command and control uh, parts of the military and uh, what are known as operational flight programs. So these are the, this is the software that actually runs airplanes, basically. That software uh, helps people uh, who are actually engaging in missions um, to communicate back get critical information to pursue the mission or fight the battle, and also to communicate steps back toward two headquarters so they can uh, send additional uh, equipment, reinforcements, they can change the battle plan. Uh, those are the kinds of things that that communication software enables. So clearly working on some fairly complex solutions, clearly working on some things that are, that are very important and critical and are integrated in very tightly with a number of other solutions. So the question for, that we next asked Mark was, what are the things that he saw as being really, really the keys to his project success as he's worked on different projects for the military and state government? So I think the biggest differences between programs that I've worked on or been associated with that were successful and programs I've seen that were failures is really probably three key things. One is that they didn't try to figure it all out up front. But at the end of the day, we're human beings. We're not very good at predicting the future. It's just the nature of being human. The other is that technology is changing so fast that if we try to set something in concrete that we're going to deliver a year or two years from now, that thing is going to be obsolete by then. So instead, working incrementally, getting things out there early and getting feedback from users on what's really working and not working, I think is one of the most fundamental aspects of having a successful system. So I'm sorry about, the, sorry about the challenges with kind of hearing him and understanding that. But fundamentally what he said is, as humans, we're not very good at predicting the future, right? So we just, we just don't predict the future very well. Secondly, that change happens very quickly. Um, and there's so many things going on and changing. Um, and he was really suggesting incremental releases and incremental delivery of value is kind of the key components of, of his suggestion. So now, um, so now that we deliver to customers on these incremental milestones, right? So now that we have working software that we're delivering it to them on a regular basis, how do we take advantage of that to actually reduce the risk, right? So delivering the capabilities is one thing, but taking the feedback and incorporating it into future releases and future plans is the next question. So the first thing on that is it's very important for you to take, and a lot of times you have to change your team structure from being functional silos into being um, cross-functional teams. 
So in order to deliver software components that are, that are, I'm sorry, in order to deliver software solutions that are a complete workable solution, you need to reorganize those teams so that they're cross-functional teams. When those teams then deliver value, then there are a number of activities that we can use and to leverage to gain the feedback from our constituents and from our stakeholders, and also that we can use to build confidence and build better relationships with them. So the more visibility we give them, the more information they have, the more confidence that they have in what we're doing, and it helps to build a much stronger relationship between uh, the development team or the IT team and the, and the actual business side. And there's techniques like tabletop demos. So tabletop demos or walkthroughs are an opportunity to see how the solution is working um, in a real life situation. It allows them to go through and fundamentally understand the gaps between the original written requirements and how the solution is actually working. You can do the same kind of objectives with pilot testing. You can take smaller groups of users and let them use it in real life situations. You can do parallel runs between a production system and a new system. So there's a lot of different techniques to let to let your users actually work with the solutions in real life situations and incorporate those feedback into your future rounds. So you take that feedback, you, do, you deliver your milestone number one, you incorporate the feedback and understand what they're looking for, put together your plan for the next milestone, implement that next milestone, then go forward and move on the next one. So that eventually you hit the same objective, quite often with the same budget or potentially even with a smaller budget because you're really focusing in on the things that provide the most value to them and not necessarily on this long list of requirements that the customer had originally asked for. So here are the key takeaways from, a, uh, from this perspective. The first that I'd suggest is deliver early and deliver often. Right? So get something out into your customers' hands that they can see, feel, and touch as early as possible. I always encourage my teams to start and put together a list and say, what's the least amount you could do? And then cut it in half. Because you, you can always find things that you can take off of the list. Build your milestones based off of working software. So change your concept of milestones. Do milestones as short of a time frame as you, could, as you can. Four weeks, six weeks, maybe eight weeks, but if you start getting anything over that, you really need to start thinking about it. Use opportunities to gain feedback from your customers and stakeholders. So do tabletop demos, do pilot testing, do uh, any of the number of different methodologies to get feedback based on what you've actually built. And then a couple of supporting techniques are cross-functional teams, so we talked about the importance of cross-functional teams and putting these solutions together. And then secondly, continuous delivery techniques. Continuous delivery is a, is a uh, fairly extensive kind of model to get to, but what I'd encourage you to do is take a look at the techniques that are, that are most relevant for your teams and implement the portions of it that are, that are important to you um, in order to help you to improve and optimize the effectiveness of your teams and make it easier for them to deliver on these incremental milestones. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Scott Reed. Scott's a colleague of mine. Um, I've worked with him for several years. And he's gonna talk a little bit about two things. One is, how do we identify the value? And then secondly, um, how do we bring the value forward? Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Um, wanted to turn our focus to stakeholder value and how we deliver it. But first, I want to talk about an experience I had just a little while back. Um, me and my wife, we decided to, to build our dream home. And uh, we, we, we embarked upon it. It was, it was a real adventure that we were going to enjoy. And we'd been thinking about it for a while. And we'd gone through a lot of model homes. And we were trying to figure out, do we want two bedrooms, three bedrooms? Um, how big is the garage? Do we want an office? Um, essentially, we're trying to think of everything we might need. So we get our list, we throw everything on there, and we go out and we find some contractors, we get some bids, and very quickly we realize that we weren't going to be able to afford everything we wanted. Um, so we had to make some tough decisions. We had to think about what were our real current needs and what were our future needs and what we could do about that. So we started to take a look at the trade-offs, and we really need to figure out how we could align what we could afford with our lifestyle. 
So we were talking, and of course my wife was focused on the kitchen, maybe some extra cabs and some space. And I'm thinking, we need to entertain. We need a pool room. <laughs> well, of course, I wasn't able to make the case for the pool room. It wasn't as important. And when we sat down, we talked about it. We realized that really the extra space in the kitchen, the cabinets, it really fit our current needs. And the pool room could be something that maybe we could look at down the road. So we continue to visit the list. We continue to look at trade-offs. And we figured out how do we align with our budget with the expectation that we could build on in the future. We could maybe get that pool room and extend the house later. Whoops, got to go forward. So I'm sure you guys are hearing this in your projects. You talk with your stakeholders and they try to get everything in there. They want to get an end-to-end -end solution. They maybe think about going out and buying the solution. Maybe that would be a faster way to do it. They throw everything in there, even the kitchen sink. Now, the tough thing is that they want to try to solve all their problems in one shot. But the interesting thing is it had a really tough effects on how many requirements we try to face in this day. So I want to talk to you about a survey uh, from stakeholders about project or product use. Now, there's two parts to this I want to look at. If you look at the things that you never use and rarely use, that amounts to about 64% of the requirements out there in the market. Now, that's really a big waste. I mean, that's a lot of things we build that we don't use. Now, if you look at the other end of that spectrum and you say, well, what are the things that we use often or always? We realize, well, that's the top 20%. Maybe that's where we should be looking for value. So you can see, we tend to focus on everything we need. And in the market today, as you know, as Bob discussed earlier, the change of the rate of change is happening so fast and IT is in all facets of our lives. The set of requirements is doing the same thing. It's ever increasing in size. And let's admit it, building things is expensive, especially with IT. I'd like to tell you a little bit about a company that's had some success, though. The company is called Maersk. You may have heard about them. They had an incident with some Somali pirates, their captain. Uh, Richard Phillips, he was held captive in a lifeboat, and then the Navy SEALs came in and saved the day, and everything turned out okay. Um, but Maersk is a very large company. They have over $150 million a year in their IT. They have 20 teams spread out around the world, and they realized they had a problem. They needed to rethink the way they do projects. They knew they had an ever-increasing need for IT. They were projecting out over the next few years how the cost was going up so fast. It was just too high. They realized that their slow delivery of solutions and projects were just unacceptable. And their decision making was pretty much suboptimal. I mean, they couldn't make a good decision in a timely way. So how did they do it? How did they find the value? Well, they needed to find ways to surface business value. They went through all their requirements, all their product lines, and what they found was the 80-20 rule really applied. They could exert 20% of the effort, and they could get 80% of the result. And let's look at this graph. If you look at, there's about 100 things on there. There's actually about 90. And if you look at the top 20 things on the left, you can see there's a lot of value there. But when you look to the right of the 20% mark, you can see that value is very hard to discern. It diminishes pretty quickly in the top 20%. They also found that the top 25% was 1,000 times more valuable than the bottom 25% of the things that were on their requirements list. That's incredible. Now, How do we find a way to do what Merckx did? They put a lot of time and effort into it, so 
Maybe we can look at some of the things they did that maybe you can leverage in your projects. But first, I want to talk about project success. Is it the iron triangle? Do we want to deliver everything that the customer asked for originally on time and on budget? Or is it that we want to deliver value with the resources that we have? I would hope you'd all agree with me that it's value. So let's measure value. You know, there's quite a few techniques out there to get to dollars quickly, but I don't want to get into that today. That's another discussion. Um, but the important thing is that you want to put dollars to requirements, either in cost savings or increased revenue is where you want to apply it. Now, let's look back at the project delivery cycle that Bob was sharing with us. I'd like to talk about requirements and focusing on how to find the value, how to bring the value to the customer faster. Now, we all have priority. We use priority in our projects. We prioritize our requirements. The challenging thing is how we do it. Now, we use things like critical, blocker, must-haves. It's a perfect example of how we don't apply dollars to requirements. We may apply it at the beginning of a project and say, is there going to be a benefit? But we don't take it down deeper than that. I'm sure you've all heard things like, we have to have all of this, or these are all high priority, or this release isn't useful unless we have all these things in it. Now, I'd like to propose that you rethink the way you look at these categories and have two things in mind, value and forced priority. Now, how we do that is by focusing on quantifying the value with the stakeholder. Generally, you can't do that once you get beyond the justification, but you need to get those, those sessions and you need to be able to work with your stakeholder to focus on quantifying the value. No two requirements have the same value. They shouldn't have the same priority. You need to get to dollars regardless and establish a forced priority. Now what that gives us is a dynamic priority list. When you start doing this, things of high value float to the top and things of low value start to float to the bottom. It's dynamic because things change over time, value changes over time. The more we work with stakeholders, the more we learn, things change. What this does is provide us with a priority for doing implementation and scheduling. Now this also gives us an opportunity at each milestone to take the highest value features and pull them off the list. Now, what we can do is we can take dynamic priority, like Merck's did, a step further. Let's put a price tag on time. Essentially, the basic premise is business value per week over duration. Now, it's simply just asking, what's the cost of deferring this feature till later? What it tells us is what we should do now and what can wait. Let's look at a simple example. Cost of delay. When you assume two features have the same dollar value, they both are worth, let's say, $150 a week, and one takes four weeks to develop, and one takes two weeks to develop. Which one would you implement first? Essentially, which one would win? It's pretty obvious. It's going to be the one that takes less time to build. It's natural for us to say, well, I want to get the best deal. I'm just, <laughs> I want to get the best bang for my buck. When you look at it in this way, you incentivize scope reduction. Now, we know we face challenges with scope today, especially with our releases. It's interesting. Um, I was working with a team just this week, and we had been, uh, they, they'd been using cost of delay for a while now, a uh, couple of months, and they were using it for their roadmap, their high-level roadmap. And we were at the end of a milestone, we were having a session, and we were talking about what we were going to do next. And there was these three requirements that just kept slipping off the list. High priority stuff or high value stuff would come in and, and beat them out each milestone. And one of the stakeholders said, uh, 
Well, we got to have all of these. They're, they're causing problems in production, and we need we just we need these things done now. I, it, it there's a workaround, but it's really a pain. And I said, well, maybe we could use cost of delay to to figure out which one to do first. Maybe figure out which one to pull out. And they said, uh, oh, I'm not sure. I, I I'm going to have a hard time quantifying value on these, or I mean, quantifying dollars on these. And I said, well, what do you mean? And they were like, well, you know, it's a, it's a customer perception thing. We're kind of introducing some bad data if we get these things fixed. And so it causes customers to call us. And I said, well, why don't we do this then? Why don't we say that they're all worth the same? They all have the same value. Which one would you do first? Before I even finished my sentence, one of the stakeholders raised their hand. They're like, oh, requirement 337. Let's take that one out. Duration's too long, it's worth less. I was like, wow, that was amazing. I thought this was gonna be a lot harder conversation. So how do we change the order of priorities when we're inside fixed scope projects? Actually, dynamic priority lists make it easy. We just swap the order at the next milestone. For example, if you're in a feedback session and your customer is saying, ah, this, 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 this requirement right here is more valuable. I need to get it sooner. It's already in our requirements list. Why not just swap their position and deliver it in the next milestone? So we can move things around inside of our fixed scope. The result is value gets brought forward. We are able to move things forward, get them sooner, and that's the goal. Now, we can also look at how we add value to our project. We're, especially after requirements are frozen, how do we do that? Well, if you just use some horse trading, as we call it, you, whenever you discover new requirements of higher value, it makes change control that much easier. You simply just horse trade new requirements you've discovered that are high value for things that are at the bottom of the list. You can simply just take them out and then you don't have an impact on your budget. And it's pretty easy to have that conversation with a stakeholder when they're getting all these high value things, their confidence has been built, and they're happy with what you've been delivering. Now, let's look back at what Bob was talking about earlier and, and say, well, we got our body of requirements. If we use dynamic priority lists and we pull value forward, I mean, we pull value from the first mile out of the list, the highest value ones first, then we can also use the plan, do, check, act, as he discussed before, and we end up bringing value forward. We end up now having an opportunity to follow the value. As customers' needs change, we can adapt the plan and deliver high value. We can increase our chance of hitting the target and we can reduce our scheduled risk. So, here are the takeaways. We've talked about four ways in which we can discover and prioritize value. If we use these techniques like quantifying value with the stakeholders, we can improve their confidence and we can have them drive the project. They drive the solution. If we use dynamic priority lists in conjunction with Cycle times, you can adjust your plan so you can move around inside your fixed scope. Move things around inside your fixed scope and you can bring value forward. Last, or the third one, cost of delay. If we put a price tag on time, then we can improve our prioritization and we can add savings to our budget. Essentially, we can focus on the 80% of the value for 20% of the effort. And lastly, horse trading. Scope change requests become a lot easier when you have that dynamic priority list. When there's things of less value, you can easily just get them taken out of scope and stay on budget. Well, thanks for talking with me, or I should say listening to me. Um, I'd like to bring Bob back up and he can give us some closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Hello? So just a real quick recap, um, we kind of started out by talking about a couple of industry trends, things related to increasing cycle time and driving more value. 
We talked a little bit about the Boston Marathon and how the Boston Marathon and the triaging process there takes advantage of uh, dynamic prioritization lists and pulling value forward and, and taking advantage of new data very quickly. We, and then we kind of expanded on those concepts for the, rest of, for the rest of the session. I think at this point we probably have five or ten minutes for question and answer, something like that, and I think Andrea will probably uh, facilitate that for us. And once again, if you have other questions, like to talk about any of these concepts further, we'll be available for the rest of the day off of the site in this room. Thanks. You're welcome. Am I, am I on? Did you turn it back Hello? on? Did you turn it back on? Okay, so do we have any questions out there? So I don't know about you, but that sounds a little familiar to me. It sounds a little bit like something called agile. Why are we so afraid of that word? So my question to you would be, can you elaborate on that in, in terms of how your approach may or may not relate to really what we consider agile? Yep. Sure, and that's, I think that's a great question. The, the concepts and the topics that we talked about, um, I think probably have their origin in lean techniques. So, um, you know, the dynamic prioritization, the uh, pulling value forward, the incremental releases, the fast feedback cycles are all things that are pretty typical of, of lean kinds of models. And uh, there's a number of different methodologies that are based on that. So Agile is based on it, Scrum is based on it, Lean. So there's a number of different, uh, uh, different techniques. That being said, I think that they're equally applicable that you can pull into other projects too. So you can do Agile full bore, or I think you could pull these into some of the other projects that you've been doing for more of a waterfall kind of basis. And you'll get a lot of the same benefits and values in that too. Great, thank you. Any other questions out there? Okay, so I have one other. Um, what do you do when you're doing going through this effort um, and your, your stakeholders come from cross-breed operations, right? So what they may see as a cost value priority um, will vary differ differently. Um, yet, if removed on any one basis, it's critical impact. Um, how, how do you then prioritize something? I'm sorry, could you? So you have competing priority. One says it's oh. low, the other says it's high? Oh, sure, yep, absolutely. No, that's a, that's a great point, and that's, um, that happens all the time. I think one of the things that I've experienced with, um, with the cost of delay concept where you're trying to quantify the business value is that it actually helps the, the business side and the business stakeholders to come to more of a consensus as far as the overall value that that solution provides and those requirements provide. So it ends up being really more th their responsibility to go through and do the accounting of it and to, and to quantify the value of it. But then it also pulls all of that together in a way that, that provides them with more visibility and allows the business side to make really be involved much more in the decision making process. The other thing that I've seen work well is, um, although you come up with this list based on priorities, there are occasionally some cases where something that has a lower business value just has to be moved up in the list. So there might be government regulations or things that you have to hit on a particular time frame, but if you build that list in priority order and you'll I'll put a forum together so that they have the visibility into that, then it makes it really easy for them to say, okay, that item that's fifth on the list, it just has to be done you know, by a particular time frame, and then you can move it up to the appropriate time frame based on what their particular needs are. So it's a starting off point for which they can adjust. Uh, I've got a question. Outside looking in, uh, the, the structure of the procurements tend to be uh, fairly strict. How do, you, how do you change requirements once the, the project has been awarded and implemented? Is that, a, is that actually a possibility within the government policy framework? And I, I'm, I'm kind of addressing that to Andrea, and then maybe <laughs> you can help if you guys have experience working with it, other public sector entities and how they manage that. Yeah. You'd have to hit procurement. Um, so it probably depends on what you're talking about when you talk about requirements, right? And, and we all know this, that uh, depending on the, the expanse of what we're changing in the requirements, it may require that you either NCB a contract or, um, you know, go through some, some other procurement vehicle. Um, in, in any case, I think the reality is that um, we're working on our procurement processes, right? And, and we're working on our project processes because what we recognize is, is really what we're hearing today 
And really what we're seeing is that that type of flexibility needs to somehow be available to us um, as we go forward in developing IT solutions. And so having very rigid and rigorous uh, procurement strategies um, aren't necessarily favoring us well as we go forward in trying to implement. So um, I, I think your point, Russ, is very clear, but it is one of the areas that we're currently actively looking at. Yeah, so, yeah the, I guess the other thing that I, that I would suggest is being something that, that may work for you, um, and Mark Noman talked about this in his experiences working with similar kinds of contracting vehicles, is the horse trading concept. So it allows you to define a set, set of fixed requirements and then swap things in and out. So you're, um, you're changing the budgeting process. You still have to go through a procurement process to make that happen. But if you're doing the functionality and the things that provide the highest value first, and you get halfway through a project and come to the conclusion that there are new or different needs that you have, it does give you the opportunity to swap out the things that are providing lower value to your team members. Okay, so if there are no other questions, I would like to thank both Bob Hedgecock and Scott Reed for Result Tech for taking the time this afternoon to, to meet with us during our lunch hour. Thank you very much. Thanks. So uh, it concludes our lunch hour session. Recognize the next series of sections begin at 2 o'clock in the rooms. Um, you have about a half an hour until that occurs. Please take an opportunity to uh, mix in with your vendors that have supported this event as well as each other. And uh, stay true to that challenge of Mr. Ramos to uh, secure three business cards from someone that you currently don't have a card from. And with that, good afternoon and enjoy the rest of the afternoon.